Almost 80 years ago, on the 8th of May 1945, the Allied troops of World War II entered Berlin. Just after the surrender of the Germans, while investigating the secret nooks and crannies of the city, they realised something they had not been expecting to find at all. Hitler had a weapon of mass destruction stored in the German capital, a very powerful weapon that had not been used in any war to date and that possibly could have given victory to whatever side used it first. Fortunately, before that weapon was complete, the Allies invaded Germany and Hitler did not have enough time to be able to extract its full potential. Now, the curious thing is that the Allies did not find this weapon in a bunker or even in a nuclear development center, nor even in a mega biochemical laboratory. The weapon was hidden in the Reichsbank, the central bank of Nazi Germany. It turns out that Hitler had been using thousands of Jewish counterfeiters to create fake British pounds sterling, pounds that were completely indistinguishable from the real thing. Such was the level of perfection of these counterfeit pounds that not even the Bank of England itself was able to differentiate an original English pound from an imitation pound that the Nazis had managed to sneak into some banks. But why? Why did Hitler want to manufacture counterfeit pounds? How could a few banknotes become a weapon of mass destruction? Well, visual economic fans, the answer to these questions can be summed up in one word, hyperinflation. Although we now associate hyperinflation with countries like Venezuela or Argentina, back in the 1920s, Germany was the example of what not to do if you are the central bank of a country. The fact is that at the end of the First World War, the powers of the Triple Entente, that's France, the UK and Russia, forced Germany to pay the costs and damages of the war. As you can imagine, for a country that had just lost a war, having its people living in misery and having no money to rebuild itself, it was almost impossible for Germany to pay those bills. However, the Germans had no choice. They were the losers and they had no choice but to obey. But then Germany's leaders came up with an idea. What if we just printed money? to pay for the cost of the war. I mean, frankly, there didn't seem to be a much better solution. They had to pay their debts. So no sooner said than done, the Germans started printing marks to pay off their bills. Obviously, the consequences were not long in coming. In 1922, Germany suffered the greatest hyperinflation in history. A hyperinflation so savage that its economy collapsed completely. To give you an idea, the price of products increased tenfold every week. Just imagine if a loaf of bread that today cost you $1, next week cost you $10, and then the following week cost you $100. And at the end of the month, that same loaf of bread will cost you more than $10,000. It's completely insane. Right? I assure you that this stuck in the memory of the Germans. It stuck with them so much that years later, they realized that the same hyperinflation that had sunk Germany in the 1920s could be used as a weapon against other countries, such as the United Kingdom. To do so, it was only necessary to create thousands of banknotes, load them onto airplanes, and flood the enemy's streets with their own currency. This way, hyperinflation would destroy their economy, dismantle their army, and practically force the enemy to surrender. However, while this story is very interesting, in this video, we're going to go a little further. Let's take a look at the world today. What if we told you that it is possible to print money without inflation? And what if we also told you that there is a type of inflation that is more worrying than the one caused by printing money? A type of inflation process that we could also be entering today. Pay close attention and let's get cracking. Money is sin. In the year 1554, a Spanish monk may named Martin de Azpilicueta noticed something strange. Ever since Columbus arrived in America, something strange was happening in Spain. Something that nobody expected and that luckily he wrote down in his book, Comentario Resolutio de Cambrios, a resolutory commentary on changes. A book where he explained the following. In France, where there is much less money than in Spain, bread, wine, and cloth are worth much less. Even in Spain, when before the men of the Americas covered us with gold and silver, saleable things were cheaper. Martin de Azpilcuta. Indeed. He was one of the first economists who discovered that increasing the quantity of money in an economy did not increase its wealth, but rather increased its prices. Although clearly 500 years have passed since then and economic science has advanced a little, so we have some news to tell you. Let's look at the following graph. Thank you. 
As you can see, for more than 10 years, the amount of money in Europe has not stopped increasing. During this time, the European Central Bank has created a lot of new money. The question is, why did it do that? Well, among other reasons, because after the 2008 crisis, the states needed money to finance the public debts. And do you know what? Printing money is a very good way to reduce the interest rate and allows you to get into debt very cheaply and reactivate the economy. However, what is surprising is not that. What is surprising is that despite printing banknotes for so long, until 2020, European inflation had remained constant. How is it possible that, despite the fact that the European Central Bank has been printing so much money, inflation has not picked up until now? Does all this contradict economic theory? Well, visual economic viewers, to answer these questions, we have to present you with a formula. Check this out. The Quantitative Equation of Money The quantitative equation of money is a formula that serves to explain what inflation in an economy depends on. But don't worry, this is visual economic, not a math channel. So, instead of talking about numbers and equations, we're going to explain to you directly the three reasons on which inflation depends according to quantitative theory. The first reason for inflation is the one we've already seen and which the most people are familiar with, the amount of money in circulation. Basically, the greater the quantity of money, the higher the inflation rate. This is because if there is more money in the economy, people will be willing to pay more for the same products, so sellers will be able to raise prices until a new equilibrium point is reached. This brings us to the second explanation of inflation, productivity. If there is more money, but also more productive capacity, the money will be distributed in the same way as before and prices will not rise. Let's take an example. Suppose an economy has two dollars and two hours apples, nothing more. To distribute the apples, each one will be worth one dollar. Easy enough, right? If at that moment we print money so that we have four dollars for two apples, then there will be inflation and each apple will see its price increase to two dollars. But if while having four dollars, you also increase the number of apples to four, then there will be more money in circulation, but there will also be more goods, more apples. So there'll be no inflation and each apple will be worth the same as the beginning, one dollar. This is the classic conclusion of the quantitative equation. However, there is still a third factor that explains inflation, the velocity of money. And now the question is, what on earth are you talking about when you say the velocity of money? Well, nothing more and nothing less than how fast bills change hands. In a way, this shows our propensity to consume, or in other words, our unwillingness to save. For example, when society is convinced that the economy is going to do very well over the next few years, banks give more credit. We spend more and consumption increases, which will allow companies to raise prices. In short, the higher the velocity of money, the higher the inflation. However, the opposite is also true. A lower velocity of money can slow down the inflationary effects of printing banknotes. No matter how much more and more money is printed, if people keep it under the proverbial mattress, then prices will not rise much. And that is just what has been happening for the last 10 years in Western economies. Check this out. So knowing all this, can the government print and spend money without inflation? Well, yes, theoretically, it is possible. You can do it as long as you expect output to increase or the velocity of money to slow down, which is exactly what has happened lately in the Eurozone. In fact, theoretically, the government itself could print money, spend it, and have that spending serve to increase production. For example, by building roads that would allow more companies to produce more. Although, of course, I'm sure you know that there is a huge gap between theory and practice. The truth is that most of the attempts to make that happen have ended in tragedy. Argentina closes 2020 with an inflation rate of 36.1%. If disaster strikes, if governments cause monetary chaos by printing banknotes, is there any solution to inflation? And can countries like Argentina do anything to curb their high priced increases? Well, let's take a look at that right now. Deflating the bubble. You probably hear about central banks all the time, right? These entities have a power that no one else has, the power to regulate two fundamental aspects of the economy, the interest rate and inflation. And even if I say it quickly, the truth is that regulating inflation and interest rates is not so simple. As much as a central bank can modify them, the fact is that it cannot control them at the same time. Because if it decides to raise one, the other 
will go down. And if it decides to raise the other, then the first one will go down. So the central bank can only have one objective, either to control inflation or to control the interest rate. Now, why is that? Because if the central bank decides to lower interest rates, then commercial banks will lend more, people will have more money to spend, and inflation will rise. If, on the other hand, the central bank raises interest rates, this will contradict credit and prices will fall. In short, the main tool to control inflation is to go in the opposite direction with the interest rate. Now, the question is, what mechanism does it have to do so? Let's find out. Control tools. For example, the European Central Bank can print 100 euros and exchange it with a conventional bank for a government bond valued at 100 euros. By doing so, the bank will not have more wealth. It will have exchanged a 100 euro voucher for 100 euros in cash. Now, the interesting thing here is that you'll be able to lend that 100 euros to your clients, while the bond could not be lent to anyone. In other words, by putting liquid money into banks, they will be able to lend more and they will be able to lower interest rates. Similarly, if the injection of liquid money is reduced, interest rates will tend to rise. And guess what? This is precisely one of the measures that the European Central Bank has taken to try to curb post-coronavirus inflation. European Central Bank slows its bond purchases as inflation surges. The second mechanism of central bank control is known as the fractional reserve. Remember when we showed you how much money there was in Europe? Well, the truth is that this money is not actually the real money that exists in Europe. Check this out. The red line is the graph we showed you earlier, the total money circulating throughout the economy, the sum of what we have in our pockets and in our banks, right? However, the blue line is the real money that exists, the money that you can touch and put in a piggy bank. So then where does the rest of the money come from? Well, it comes from the fact that banks, by giving credit, can somehow create money out of thin air. And although this is somewhat more complex than what I'm about to explain, it is basically as if banks were lending money without actually having it. In any case, the important thing about all this is that they have a restriction. For example, banks in Europe have to have at least 1% of their deposits backed by real physical money. And so, if they want to lend, say, a thousand euros, they must have at least 10 euros in reserve. This is called fractional reserve, and it prevents banks from lending and creating money without limit. As you can imagine, the higher the fractional reserve, the less money banks can lend and create. And the less money banks can lend, the higher the interest rate and the lower inflation is. Okay, you may be wondering, so why should I care about any of this? Well, because the central bank can change the fractional reserve so that banks can lend more or less, thus changing the interest rate. Do you remember when we told you that after the 2008 crisis, the European Central Bank decided to lower interest rates? Well, one of its star measures was precisely to modify the fractional reserve. Until January 2012, credit institutions were required to hold a minimum ratio of 2% of certain liabilities, mainly customer deposits, with their national central banks. Since then, this ratio has been reduced to 1%. ECB, 11th of August, 2016. However, as much as central banks have tools to correct inflation, there is a type of inflation against which they cannot easily use these tools. You see, visual economic viewers, I am talking to you about stagflation. Stagflation is the greatest threat to Europe's recovery, warns ex-Italian PM Monti. Now, the question is, what is the difference between stagflation and normal inflation. Well, you see, with normal inflation, that is a gradual increase. The typical thing is that prices of products go up, but not only that. With normal inflation, people's incomes and salaries also rise. And what does this mean? Well, even if prices rise, the standard of living remains more or less constant and may even increase. Until 50 years ago, it was thought that this type of inflation, except from extreme cases of hyperinflation, was the only one that existed. In fact, some economists suggested that it was impossible that with minor inflation, wages, employment level and economic activity would not rise. At the time, moderate inflation was understood as a sign that something was really going well in the economy. So much so that William Phillips, a prestigious economist, developed his famous Phillips curve, where he precisely reflected the inverse relationship between unemployment and inflation. But, surprise, surprise, despite all the mathematical theorizing, there was something economists didn't see coming. We now have the worst of both worlds, not just inflation on the one side or stagnation on the other, but both of them together. We have a sort of stagflation situation, and history, in modern terms, is indeed being made. These are the words of Ian McLeod, a British Conservative Party politician in the House of Commons when, in 1965, Britain first went through a period when economic boon and inflation did not go hand in hand. 
While prices were rising higher and higher, wages were falling and unemployment was rising. The Phillips curve had been dismantled. He called this unexpected phenomenon stagflation. Yes, he didn't strain his brain too much. He put the words stagnation and inflation together in one word and bingo, stagflation. In any case, eight years after the emergence of stagflation in Great Britain, the event that would consolidate the term and make it clear that stagflation was a real problem, the one that was here to stay, broke out. <laughs> talking, of course, about the oil crisis. And this is where many more questions arise. How did stagflation play out in the US? What were its effects? Are we really approaching a new stagflation era as Mario Monti claims? Can we get out of it? We will answer all these questions in the second part of this video, which we'll upload in just a few days. Until then, you can leave your predictions and questions in the comments. As always, don't forget that here on Visual Economic, we release new videos every week. So subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell button down there so you don't miss any of our updates. And if you like this video, like it so we know. I'll see you next time.